Um, I'm still, hello, we'll get started. Um, I'm afraid I'm still under, uh, had some severe dentist issues and I'm on some very loopy pain medication, so anything I say may be ridiculous, more ridiculous than normal, so just be aware I'm not completely with it at the moment. Um, we're going to stick with the novel, so Patrick will be running most of the session leading us on the novel to continue talking. One of the things I've done a little bit of this week, very rapidly, is I've been looking at some of the criticism of the novel, which I'm not sure if this is something that's a good idea. Whether you advise people to read uh, different people have different ways of approaching it. I don't care one way or the other. I've been reading a bit of what pe other people have said about the novel, and um, it, it's quite fascinating. The, uh, there was one that was um, uh, uh, this one from the tour.com. A rumination on criticism via Richard Powers Galatea 2.2. I find this one really interesting because the guy absolutely loved the novel and also really hated it. And he couldn't work out which it was. So it's a very interesting, um, that one was very interesting to read. Do you remember why he hated it? And why he loved it? Um, beautiful and provocative, defiantly speculative. I like having something to chew on, but the pleasure of not having the right answer irritated me. So he, it was as if he wanted Richard Powers to come up with some sort of answer to his consciousness problem, but he didn't do. That's kind of a tall Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Why can't you answer all my questions, you novelist? Yeah. Yeah, so. He also says the book is quite self-indulgent, which he, he doesn't like, but he does like some of the intellectual conversations. So he's, he has both kind of sides to it. But, uh, there's a much longer review and more detailed review, which includes an interview with Richard Powers in the Paris Review, which is, it says a lot of the things that were in the same interview. Right. Himself. That interview by Jeff Williams has been great uh, everywhere. Yeah. Um, but what I was going to start today with, um, just for conversation's sake, is the University of Illinois, where the University of U that he goes back to, um, has recognizes that Richard Powers is sort of a famous person there. And so what, one of the things they've done is this little podcast where they've got some of their students to make a reflection on part of the novel, a visual reflection. So it's a little bit of a reading of part of the novel and some visuals to go along and see what you think. By then, my dying father's face was ashen, and the laugh in his eyes had glazed. But when Teresa and I hit our groove around the second verse, he lit up. One this is from time. a different novel, isn't it? But it's an interesting For my father, impression. music's joy was composed, harmonic. Several arcs spinning in space at once, each one traced by the voice of a near relation. Both he and his wife went to their graves, swearing that any two numbers were put together, given the right to his turn to people. As my pale, taffy girl sailed over Ellington's mountain, I tapped into some underground stream and drew up broken shards, tunes from Marshall to Mion, slipping them into my accompaniment. Teresa sailed right over there, calling it jazz. Who knows how many of the bolts that I made out here? The tunes fit inside each other. And it's all that matter. And for the seven and a half minutes my woman and I made the song last, my family took the 
inside ourselves. Baby, shall we go on skipping? Take your freedom on the road once, while you can. The two said, yes. Said, leave your answers. as well, I'm sure, but I'm not sure. It was still pretty beautiful. <laughs> I watched one of Galatea earlier, I was hoping to show you that one. And then they'd say, what was that? What was your sense of it? Oh, it's podcast number 24, that was oh. number 10. So how do I get to the other ones? That's not the one I saw before. Faders and switchers, alternating currents, alternate lifestyles. Wool and linen and damask. Finches and feeders, bats and banyans, mites and moles. Lit, lintels, lentils, lent. Insect galls and insecticides. 
making for life or for a fraction of a minute. The Great Wall. The Great Wall. The Great Wall and the Burma Road. The Great Wall and the Burma Road and 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 the Iron Curtain. <laughs> do they have some description of what they were trying to do here? Not really. Just to, to celebrate Richard Powell's accomplishments, the Provost Office pro commissioned productions of these five short video works. So it's an installment of a five part series. Collaborative endeavor between powers and a group of artists from the same <coughs> world and design. So, maybe before I start to imposing my own uh, sense of things on the, on the video, uh, why don't we, what, what, what were you thinking about? And how is the, the video project uh, striking you in relation to what you know about the novel? And we just get some general reactions because I, I could be brilliant and I could be stupid. So. Uh, but I don't want to just sort of say what I think it is and then close off the conversation. So, okay, you know, okay. It's still like I was telling me to train. Aha. I didn't hear that, sorry. It felt like I was telling me to train. Being, you know, shown words and, you know, syntax and pictures and. It, it's an interesting concept that the idea of training the neural network relied on language, and yet the images give us so much more of the content. By images you mean? The images we were seeing on the screen. Okay. Give you a totally they, different... They you, and I, that's what I'm questioning about. The images give you more of the language than the words? Different. Okay. We, as human <clears throat> beings, cannot separate ourselves from an instinctive reaction to the images we see. A biological reaction, an emotional reaction, an intelligent okay. reaction. If, if I say the word dog to you, you have one response. If I show you a picture of a dog, you have a different response. That uh -huh. dog could be snarling, that dog could be cute. And I might not be able to tell whether it's a snarling or a cute dog. It's Unless I use more language. Well, wouldn't there be such a thing where you might look at a dog and not be able to tell if it's in a defensive or well? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm just saying that the <clears throat> that's a very different. What struck me was that's not what the computer's learning. We're getting these emotional visual images that were not being given to the computer. Oh, so to, you were, to you were putting yourself in the place of Helen. Yeah, because Katie was right. You, yeah. you were thinking that you were Helen receiving the. Uh, words or yeah, that's I, I mean that's how when I was reading the book I, I guess I was putting myself in the place of Helen and that's kind of what the kind of stuff I envisioned because I was thinking like well, I was just computer and trained and I was just like what would this guy look like you know and uh, that's kind of what it was like <clears throat> at what point in the clip where, where did it look like what you imagined it looking like to Helen uh, when they started playing around with it, Different uh, grammar. 
Uh, I don't, others want to join in. Do you, do you want to respond? I still have a different view. I think uh, I felt different because you were seeing the images. Helen just got the audio, uh, you know, the words. Well, didn't they show the pictures everyone? They started showing the pictures, but that wasn't the day to day input mechanism. They didn't show her, every time he was reading a book, he didn't show her pictures of every image or concept in the book. No, it was just occasionally they started showing yeah. the photographs towards the end. Yeah, but that was when she was asking, like, I, I want to see you in Paris or whatever, mm. right? And so, like, that's when they start showing pictures of all the, yeah. all the crazy bullshit that humans do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Anthony. Oh, sorry. Oh, Anthony was having some of the first, so. I can't see Anthony. He's there. I'm awesome. Okay. So, okay. Um, both of them, um, but the, this one. Um, I think it uh, accompanies the content of the book, um, you know, in place of being, you, you said a reading it first, so I expected it to be maybe like an excerpt or something, but um, mm. I think it accompanies the theme of the book very well. Um, and it was like this, um, this sort of selective sensory experience, because um, at first you got the voice, and, and that kind of, it kind of parallels the story mm. in a way. And then it kind of culminates in this, you know, the uh, first there was, you know, just the repetition. And then there was all this stuff kind of like glommed together. And then there were images. And then the question that came up at the end, um, it was just like, ooh, okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> you liked it though. Yeah, yeah, it's enough. I didn't say I didn't like it. I thought, I thought it actually worked as a kind of standalone visual aesthetic piece. You know, yeah. like an installation. I thought it was a fine as a piece, but I didn't get the sense that it was true to the mechanism that was used for teaching, which is what it, I got the feeling it was meant to represent, and it didn't. But I, I got that. I certainly got that. But I, I think I think you're right in that respect. Um, but I can I can write that off as maybe like stylistic, oh. you know, expression on that. Uh, go ahead. I'll give you Oh, Whoever wants. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking of the whole concept of language and culture, and the old hero and um, one of these heroes and how they walk the words. I agree. I kind of felt like I was kind of in a sense, but this it is a compilation, this is a celebration for the novel. Like, they try to incorporate all the names in it. And it just goes to show how, like, like this a copy soul that was there was in the ones as the word showed up, as they like got both the rocks and more. You, you just tell how I don't know, I got a feeling that it didn't make sense after a while. Due to the fact that it was a human. It wasn't a human. You know, like it started from you know the forest floor, you know, and it started with the once it got to the forest floor, it just like sort of deviated and walked and then the lights were just kind of how it switched, you know, the eye to the E and it comes to like I got that impression in the book a lot that some of the literary passages he was reading, I was thinking, I'd struggle to understand that. You know, how it, it is a complex thing for a machine because of the ambiguity of our language and the way we compose metaphor or, or interpret. I'm just going to hold off on it a little bit. I know you. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm forgetting your name. I'm sorry. Oh, Ryan. Ryan, sorry. Um, I agree with uh, Kate. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I agree with Kate in that it seems like what we were watching was sort of what Helen was learning, but more so it's progressing. Because it started out, she was just like, well, living damnest. I don't know what that is. Uh, but then she was like, uh, sisters, transistors, alternating current, alternating lifestyles. And she stopped just like learning what similar things were and started learning like concepts of things. And then after that, she was like, uh, oh, okay. uh, Great Wall of China, the Burma Road. And then she was like, Oh, World War II, all this bad stuff. Uh, Iron Curtain, uh, emotions. And then, What am I? I'm a thing. And then, like you said, they didn't start showing her pictures to the end, but we didn't get to the pictures and to the video until she was already like past processing just concepts and. 
black and white. And the thing is how it's computerized Yeah. That's a, um, uh, your comment there was one of the things that has repeated over and over since we started this, this idea of understanding language, you said that understanding language and the meaning of words and understanding complex concepts and context, which has been a fundamental thing in our definition of humanity and um, artificial intelligence and everything else we've done so far. So that that is the same. I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. What I got from that, I got two things. First thing was, especially when she kept repeating and and I I could think of just how the novel could be laid out as in just kind of an alternative typography to maybe get some more expression out using the form of the words rather than the meaning of the words. But getting, you know, kind of soaking in what you guys have been saying, I feel like this piece was about <coughs> being overwhelmed by the possibility of teaching the machine language and syntax and emotion and how we would view it from the outside, it starts to build up and build up and build up. And I think it would, for you know, for Helen, it would. It's just the routine, the everyday. But to a human, we still can't quite get past all of the overlapping and all of the the necessary words and concepts. And uh, I've got a lot, of, a lot I can say to that one. Uh, <laughs> can't get past all the emotion. Why do we need to get past it? No, I don't know. It was because we, we as humans, it's the the thing that we do. You know, we don't think about it. If we just do it. We're able to have these emotions and have all of these separate meanings, especially you know in English, when a word that is spelled the same can mean a variety of different things. This. It, there's a big difference, it, this is regards to context, same as any piece of art, whether it hangs on your, um, whether it's a print that hangs in your house, whether it's an original in an art gallery, whether you view it in a screen, the context in which you view it changes that piece of art. I think it's the same with language, reading something in the book and the context of where you're reading it and who you are, it's different to seeing the words on the screen like that, it has a different emotional impact the way it's delivered. And so this meaning and emotion, the use of typography, the visuals, the way it's spoken, the tone of voice, a male or a female narrator changes that word and your impression of it. Mm -hmm. So we're coming down to, the, I know you can separate out this thing, bigger words than I can. Um, I don't know if I can. But also the, um, the other thing about this relating to the novel, which I find really fascinating in this, was the emphasis Richard Powers took, takes in reading out loud. It's a last resort when he puts the text into the computer for the computer to interpret on its own. It feels like he's failed or he's not done it properly. Did you get that impression when he does that in the book? In the, in the book, yeah. Uh, so the reading is a failure. No, 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 no. When he puts the text in for oh, Helen to read herself, when he okay. just puts text into the machine, that's right. almost like he's run out of time. He can't do it properly. He has to read aloud for it to have the meaning for it. So there's this big emphasis on reading aloud rather than because I kept thinking, why don't you just it could scan through them in a few hours? Why are you doing this? But that that thing on reading comes over multiple times. There's him and C reading to each other in the Netherlands. Right. There's Lentz reading to Audrey in the hospital, his memory's going. There's, um, when Taylor's dying, they read as well. So this cops up again and again as a repetitive thing about the importance of reading out loud. You know, so that, that tied in very well to this kind of idea of, you know, the emotion, it has different meaning if it's read like that. Did anyone else? Have any comment on that? Or 
Chris, yeah. Yeah, well, um, I think it all ties into the fact that by the time he gets to Ellen, he's personifying this machine more and more. I mean, they're looking to create uh, some form of consciousness so you can have a, essentially a personal connection. He's trying to have a personal connection with Helen in the same way that he's had a personal connection with everybody else in the book. Um, and then, the, you know, the deepest connection he, he makes with anybody in the book is the fact that he's reading out loud. All the inflection, the emotion given, and what he's trying to, he's not just trying, he's not trying to communicate just basic information. He's trying to kind of um, communicate human experiences through just the act of reading itself. And uh, when we were watching the video there, what threw me off is, uh, going back to you know what you said, we're not seeing what actually happens in the machine when it's learning. I mean, we're not seeing pictures of transistors and gates firing and all that. The first, even the first thing we see, ones and zeros, you know, pure uh, conception, even at the beginning, and how it builds up to different, more and more concepts, even though none of it is actually how the machine is physically learning. And I think it's all really tied into the way that he's turning Helen into a person, or at least trying to, trying to relate to something, trying to have that emotional connection that he does with every, all the other characters that he meets with. I, that's an interesting, I, I like that, that, that phrase. The, deepest, like that? the no. deepest connection he had was when reading aloud with uh, That's interesting. But I like that. But um, if any of you have never done this, um, I strongly recommend spend, taking time out and just reading to someone you care about. Not necessarily a child, it's a, it, it's a really good way to develop emotional connections with people. You know, I, I find it. I like reading to people and I like being read to. It's a way to stop and slow down and spend time with someone. And when you're reading, do you then stop and talk about what's being read or do you just you just keep reading and not interrupt? Uh, occasionally, I mean, occasionally we'll stop and talk about it, but most of the time you'll read it. You usually it was, talk about it afterwards, but... It was quite customary in, the, in parlors in the 19th century. That's right. I, so I, you know, I'm, television a, and radio. I'm a Dickens fanatic. I read lots of Charles Dickens and obsessed with Charles Dickens, but um, Dickens was serialized and people would buy the latest copy of a magazine that had the latest chapter of a story, Little Nell or the Old Curiosity Shop, and one member of the family would read it to the whole family. That's how you, traditionally how those, but they were read out loud. They were still kind of moral, an oral tradition. Right. Hey, I'm doing the English literature here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm just going to let you uh, know this is fun for me. Now, could you do me a favor and could you diagram for me, because I'm a very visual thinker, what would it, what would the structure, what would it, what would it look like when the powers and lens start to build these implementations as they move from A to Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Is> no. <there? laughs> um, and the reason, just a simple, a simple kind of diagram if it's possible. Because uh, here's, here's what I'm wondering. It seems to me that when we we're watching the video, different uh, among us, we were looking at it from our own perspectives. So Katie was saying, I was thinking that this was, I was thinking of perceiving it as if I was from hell, looking at it from Ellen's point of view. So I'm just wondering, could we kind of map out what the possible scene would look like? And then try to identify various points of view that might emerge from out of that scene. Does that make any some sense? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, so let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me do I can show you the kind of architectures they're using. But. I'm not sure this works. This one works. Oh, yeah, OK. OK, so let's just imagine we have a Richard Powers character. Philip Lenz, right? Philip's his first yeah. name, right? OK, so they're obviously in the scene. All right. So, if you're going to start to train the neural net, right? What what would they be working on? Right? Yeah. So what would the neural net look like? Yeah. So what would it look like? So they're they're in a room, right? <laughs> there's, there's maybe a. Well, they're just going to, going to see a screen. You got to well, explain me, it to me like I'm a five year old. Okay. Remember that. For those of you who are not computer scientists, yeah. here's a neural network. <laughs> um, neural networks have 
three basic uh, features. Input, output, and what we traditionally call the hidden layers in the middle. So here we have some form of feature detector. In the case of Richard Powers and, and Philip Lenz and Richard Powers, these are, this is a microphone. So it's a microphone, but what that microphone is doing is switching, turning the signal from an analog audio signal into a digital and setting it into a series of individual recognition characteristics of some type. And what we would have here in this kind of sense is some initial preprocessor which would be a natural language. <coughs> natural language processor is basically speech recognition. The kind of things you can buy for $10 now. That when you speak into your computer, you can dictate, try and dictate, and it picks up what you say. So this so our input layer coming through here, through this system here, these are all interconnected nodes. So what we have coming through here is basically the words, we're recognizing the words. <laughs> um, here we have some kind of output layer which, since we're dealing with language, would again be some form of language where we, what we want the computer to do is to know what it, to understand what's being said. So, cat sat on the mat, cat on the mat. What we're hoping to have here is we know not what a cat is, what a mat is, and that the cat is on the mat, yeah? So we're hoping to get that understanding. And the magic is all in here where you have the hidden lots and lots. These are this is a much bigger area, lots of interconnected nodes. Now, what's actually happening is you say the words cat sat on the map, you pass through here, the computer doesn't understand what you're talking about. But as you repeat it and build up this kind of context and memory, these are your connection weights, your synapses, where you start to build recognition and memory. So just like in your brain when you hear a song, the weights change connecting your neurons, when you hear it again, those weights change and the more you hear it, the weights change and the signals get stronger or weaker between certain synapses <coughs> to cause you to remember, to build the memory. That's what happens in here, we simulate that kind of process. Now this is a tiny network that you could use to recognize between two or three words. Remember we have, is it about 20 billion nodes of human? Or is it more? 100 billion. What, 100 billion? 100 billion. We have 100 billion of them. So we are at the stage, almost, where computationally we can replicate the human brain in certain We're almost there, they say, within the next few years. Um, however, <laughs> building algorithms that replicate exactly what's going on is not what Now, what, what they were doing in the book is they have these simple networks that do this low-level processing, but they particularly were interested in the idea of different levels of, of knowledge. So you have kind of signal processing at the basic level, recognizing language, but then they were building um, almost meta algorithms on top, which controlled these, and then levels and strategic levels on top of this. They kept talking about these higher level functions. They had this enormous amount of computer power at their disposal, but most of it was doing this grunt work like this. But then they had these higher level units that were overseeing. And asking me for the architecture of it, I couldn't tell you because they don't really go into right. detail. They right. talk about it in very general terms that they have these upper levels of controlling these large group. So they have these huge replication of memory right. systems. And then 
top level control systems that start to, they use these for things like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that do this. Um, pragmatics and um, context, context analysis, things like that. So, when you were imagining yourself as Helen, where were you here? <laughs> Even though he's reading text to her. I mean, he does do some personal stuff at the end, but he's reading text primarily, and very traditional text as well. Yeah, and so like, I guess on the other side of it, you know, if I'm looking at it from Richard's perspective, then, you know, I would be looking at the screen that Helen is spitting out words on, like whatever she processes and comes over with or whatever. But honestly, like, you know, when I'm People who are um, blind in or unable to process certain information. I've forgotten the exact bit. They're unable to process certain information. Yet when you sit them in front of a computer, they still scan it in the same way because that's going on in a pre-processing element. And yeah. the way we build the artificial system, we still have that kind of system where we have this pre-processing unit. So. It, it, as Brian said, it's very difficult to think about it in terms of does it start here? Yes, we all have the visual information coming in, it's actually processed in my eyes. There are neural cells processing in your eyes before information goes into your brain. So, yes, that's where things start, but is saying, is that where I start? I don't think that's a that's the way, not the way I think of it. It's all part of me. It's not where I start. I'm not trying to make a claim that I start somewhere, mm -hmm. but I am trying to problematize the so I'm, I'm trying to discover the nature of the problem rather than making a statement about the novel. Is that helping you? Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not yet taking the position where I'm saying, oh we can we can put a boundary around something and call it Helen. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to foreground that as a problem. For example, if we think just about us as individuals, I kind of have a sense that I'm over here and you're over there. Right? Mm -hmm. But uh, am I over there? Well, you, if you were a mirror, I might say, look at me, I'm over there. Right? I might point at the mirror that's out there and call it me. 
but it's a representation of me. And when I see my image in the mirror, right, not only is it modeling or copying some aspects of my appearance, it, in reflecting back at me, right, I might fix my hair. Right? In other words, I might, it does something. It's acting on me, not just passively reflecting. Okay? So there's representation in the mirror, but there's but the, it makes some sense in a way to say this. The mirror is acting on me. The mirror is doing something to me. A, a lot of times when people are in art galleries, they'll have this feeling like the painting is watching them, that the painting is 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 acting on them. They're being observed by the painting. Maybe you've had that experience in a, in an art gallery of some kind. Yeah, my students will know from the very first uh, some of the very first classes we do in intro, I introduced the guy James Elkins, the art historian, who talks, he did a book called The Object Stares Back. It's, all, it's in the introduction to vision. And what we talk about is that when you look at something, it looks back at you. You don't, viewing is not objective, an objective action. It, you change the thing you look at by looking at it. And so he has a very strong argument for this. And it ch but it changes you by looking back. Absolutely, at you. yeah. But it doesn't make any sense, does it, to say that uh, an object looks. <laughs> or does it? Does it make, actually make sense to say that the painting stares at me?
architect that makes a building. He admires his work. And that's something that's innate. That's something that instinctively the humans that you take pride in what you make. Even if you, you know, to have an opinion you fail, I like mean, like, if you have like a, a certain feeling you fail towards something, it will just show that, I don't know what it is, but the whole thing kind of thing. I can, I can There's a, there, um, one of the things that I, one reason why I started, I wanted you to look at the, uh, the, the, the AI uh, film, and I'll, I'll probably come back to it uh, at some point in the near future to look at how the film ends, is that this film is using the Pinocchio story. It adds the Pinocchio story to the source story that, uh, that, that, that uh, they were using to create the film. And the Pinocchio story is a factor in Galatea 2.2 as well. It's, there's frequent references to, uh, to the Pinocchio story very early on in the novel. I think it's in a conversation. I'm going to see if I can put my finger on it. In a conversation, there, right at the start. It might be in the, one of the first. Uh, I'm not seeing it. It might be one of the first uh, conversations that uh, Powers has with Lenz. Uh, Lenz, I think, might mention the uh, one Geppetto. He, uh, he mentions Geppetto. Anyway, I'm not. I can kind of see where it's on the page, but I'm not finding the page. My mind's on. So it's there. It's part of the. It's part of the intertext. It's part of the. It's one of the stories that makes up the story of Galaxy Two. You just say it's a modern notebook. So how, uh, like, even as us as human, you know, computer yeah. engineers and scientists, we are you know, take pride in the progression of our technology. Right. I wouldn't. Here's here's what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't rush to. A, a, here's here's one of the things that, that we don't we we resist as the very critics. Okay. When we're when we're just reading casually. And we're just picking up a book, having an experience, reading it, putting it down, moving on to another book. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll sort of tag that book. We kind of have a few convenient phrases that we use to kind of put it on the shelf and say, oh, this is what this book is, or this is what this book means. Okay? We resist that kind of reading as, as literary critics because we want to we wanna use the, the work as an opportunity for thinking about anything that we're interested in thinking about. So rather than rushing to assign a meaning to a text that we find either in the author's intention or in the significance that the readers discover in the work, rather than kind of trying to, to, to close off what the work can do, what we try to do is back off from that very attempt and let the work sort of guide us as we pose questions. Uh, of the work, or to the work, about the work, or about other things. Is that making mm -hmm. some sense? So I don't know if I did it in here. I didn't bring my flash drive tonight, but I have a quick handy, handy PowerPoint slide, which I can probably just load up on Canvas for you. It talks about the difference between a 